Okay, before we discuss accommodation, I want to define two terms that will help us in understanding it. And these are easy terms, near point and far point. The near point would be the nearest point that a patient can see clearly, any nearer, and it, it starts to get blurry. And the far point, of course, is the farthest point a patient can see clearly. For an emetropic patient, the far point would be at optical infinity, 20 feet or more. That means that on the eye chart, they would be able to read the 2020 or better. That's the far point. Accommodation. Um, when we are looking at something in the distance and it's brought closer, our eye obviously has the ability to, to adjust and focus on the object as it's brought closer with clarity. Fortunately, think about this. What if we didn't have that ability? Let's say um, Joe sees clearly at 15 feet. So everything that Joe wants to see clearly must be placed at 15 feet away from him. If he wants to read, the book has to be 15 feet away. Celeste sees clearly at three feet. So for Celeste, everything has to be placed at three feet away. Otherwise, it's not clear, it's blurry. Okay, luckily that's not the case. Our eye has the adjusting mechanism in the ciliary body and the crystalline lens. So when we're looking at something in the distance, whatever it may be, three feet, eight feet, 20 feet, and either the object is brought closer or we shift our gaze to something that is closer, our eye accommodates by changing the radius of curvature of the crystalline lens, altering the vergence power, so that, that not only the distance object is clear, but also the closer object is clear, and anything in between that we choose to focus on after that, we can also see clearly. Okay, we have here the ciliary muscle zonule and lens in three stages of accommodation. On the left, um, the eye is focusing in the distance at optical infinity. We see there the, the red infinity sign at the top. The ciliary muscle is relaxed, the zonules are taut, and the lens is flat. At rest, this lens is providing 19 diopters of accommodation. Now the stimulus that causes the eye to accommodate is blur. When something's brought closer or we want to focus on something closer, it's blurry but our eye very, very quickly accommodates to make it clear. The eye on the right is viewing something at centime seven centimeters from the eye, a distance of seven centimeters. The eye is fully accommodated, which means that this person is probably either a child or a high myo because seven centimeters is very close. But um, the eye is fully accommodating, or we say maximum accommodation, which for this eye is uh, plus 33 diopters. Assuming that this person sees clearly at infinity and at seven centimeters, infinity is the far point and seven centimeters is the near point. And the distance from one to the other is called the range of accommodation. Range of accommodation. Accommodation starts as soon as the object moves closer than infinity in this case and ends at the distance where the eye is fully accommodating. Here it's seven centimeters. Any closer in the object, it will be blurry. Now this is not necessarily comfortable for the patient, but the patient can see if need be. Now the range of accommodation is a distance measure. The amplitude of accommodation is the change in power as the eye accommodates maximally. So here the maximum is 33 diopters, but we started out at 19. So um, the amplitude is the change from 19 diopters to 33 diopters, or a change of 14 diopters. Now the amplitude of accommodation is going to vary from patient to patient, as is the range of accommodation. The amplitude of accommodation in diopters and the near point in meters are inversely proportional. Since we generally measure near points in centimeters, uh, usually, sometimes it's like one-tenth of a meter or something, but it's easier to measure in centimeters. 
a, a standard formula would be amplitude of accommodation in diopters equals 100 over the near point in centimeters. Technically, it's 1 over the near point in meters. So in our example here, um, if we didn't know the amplitude of accommodation, but we did know the patient could uh, had a near point at 7 centimeters because we tested that, we could say the amplitude of accommodation equals 100 over 7 centimeters and uh, round that to our amplitude of accommodation, which comes out to be 14 diopters. This is one example of a chart that tells you at what age it's standard for a patient to need um, what strength of accommodation of, of bifocals or what have you. And like all charts or tables pertaining to human beings, it's just an approximation. One size does not really fit all. Um, so it's just kind of something to go by, but you can't really follow it by rope. Um, the amplitude of accommodation you can see as the age increases, the amplitude of accommodation decreases, and the near point, of course, gets farther away. So the amplitude lowers, the near point raises, that's inverse proportion. So the amplitude of accommodation is the total change in dioptric power of the crystalline lens. And the range of accommodation is the distance between the near point and the far point. And while we're at it, I might as well do two more definitions. Um, the accommodative effort describes the um, contraction of the ciliary muscle, which relaxes the zonules and plumps up that crystalline lens. The accommodative response is what happens in response to the accommodative effort, the ciliary muscles contraction. So the accommodative response is uh, the increased convexity of the crystalline lens. So for an aphakic patient and a pseudophagic patient, uh, aphakia being the absence of the crystalline lens, so an aphakic patient wouldn't have a lens, and a pseudophagic patient also wouldn't have a lens, but they would have an interocular lens implant. Each of those patients would not have an accommodative response. They would still have an effort because the ciliary muscle could still contract, but there's no crystalline lens there to respond to it. Okay, there are three associated responses to, to near vision. We discussed accommodation. Convergence is when the eyes rotate inward to see the object. Meiosis is pupillary constriction. And together, these three things are referred to as, sometimes they're referred to as the accommodative reflex. It's not a true reflex, but it's sometimes called that. Sometimes it's called the synkinetic response. A minute ago, I said, what if we weren't able to change the vergence power of our eyes? And I gave an example of Joe only being able to see things 15 feet away and Celeste only being able to see things three feet away. Okay, this is a little example, something to cement into your head about um, what that might be like. As this apple comes closer to the eyeball, I want you to take a look at the focal point Right now it falls on the retina. Um, as the apple comes closer, what would happen if we weren't able to accommodate and converge the light more as it comes closer so that the focal point stayed on the retina? Okay, so did you notice what happened with the focal point? The apple would get blurrier and blurrier as that focal point moved farther and farther behind the retina. Fortunately, that doesn't happen most of the time because of our accommodating mechanisms. And the reason I wanted to show you this is because it's a pretty good lead in to what I'm gonna show you next. Okay, here's something interesting. Um, I've drawn three eyes and they're all focused on an object the same distance away. If you look at the focal points, you'll see the top eye is myopic, the center eye is emetropic, and the eye on the bottom is hyperopic. 
Now in order to show what happens, I've used a dotted navy blue line to show that the eye has begun accommodating and a dotted red line to show that the eye has reached maximum accommodative amplitude. Okay, so watch what happens. Okay, first of all, the object starts out at optical infinity. To the myope, it's not clear. And we know that because the light rays aren't focused on the retina. There's no focal point on the retina. It's somewhere in the vitreous. Um, for the hyperope, they start out accommodating. If they didn't, the object wouldn't be clear. But fortunately for the hyperope, our eye can um, accommodate and clear things up. Not so for the myope in this case. As the object moves closer, it's still not clear for the myope. Um, the focal point is still not on the retina. For the emetrope, um, they've begun accommodating, and for the hyperope, they're still accommodating. Okay, as the object moves a little bit closer, uh, the hyperope has reached their maximum accommodation. They're at their near point. Um, if the object moves any closer, they won't be able to see it clearly. The emetrope is still accommodating. The myope is not accommodating yet. However, they have reached their far point. They can now see this object clearly. And once we've moved a little bit closer than the far point for the myope, they begin accommodating. The emetrope is still accommodating. The object moves a little closer and the emetrope has reached their near point. The myope is still accommodating. And the object moves closer and the myope finally reaches uh, their near point. Now I want you to look at where the object sits for each one. The hyperope's near point is much farther than the emetrope and the myope. And the myope's is much closer than the emetrope and the hyperope. Um, the myope is able to see things much closer because they're already converging the light too much. They already have a little bit too powerful an eye. So they have an advantage that way. Now, of course, um, the myope and the hyperope, if they wear corrective lenses, if they're corrected to an emetrope, then they're right along with the, the emetrope. Now we can modify our definitions of near point and far point. So the near point is the closest point a patient can see while accommodating maximally. And the far point is the closest point a patient can see without having to accommodate at all. We discussed earlier that the range of accommodation declines with age. This is due primarily to the changes in the malleability of the crystalline lens and perhaps some changes in the flexibility of the ciliary muscle as well. Eventually, that near point recedes so far that it's no longer comfortable to read, or the arms aren't long enough to hold the reading material beyond the near point. Either way, this is the point at which a person's considered presbyopic. At this point, the person needs corrective lenses. He needs plus lenses to move the near point closer. There are many different types of lenses to correct presbyopia. I'm only going to mention a couple of the more popular types. You have your reading glasses, which are simple magnifiers, simple plus lenses that can be picked up at a drugstore to be worn only for reading or other near vision needs either the half lenses or the full reader's magnifiers. Blind bifocals. These particular pair here shown are D28s or flat top 28s, called such because the D refers to the shape of the bifocal segment, shaped kind of like a D on its side, and 28 is the measure in millimeters across the segment. Now they don't have to be 28s. 28 is probably the most common, but it's not uncommon to see D35s or D22s. The number refers to the width. The height of the segment, referred to as the seg height, is set to patient preference. But quite often the patient doesn't have a preference. Maybe it's their first pair or they've never been asked before. The standard is to the lower lash line because that just seems to be the most comfortable spot um, to keep it 
from irritating the wearer. Then you have your trifocal, whereas the bifocal had the two strengths built into the lens, distance and near. The trifocal has an additional segment, that rectangular um, section there, that's for intermediate work, maybe the computer length or piano or something. Um, this, these are commonly 7 by 28s. The 7 refers to the height of that little trifocal segment. Progressive lenses enable the wearer to have corrective lenses not just for their distance and near, or distance near and intermediate, but for distance near and all lengths in between. The way these lenses work is that you have your distance prescription right at the pupil as the eyes are looking straight ahead, and then the reading prescription is at the very bottom of the lens. And the lens is made so that it corrects for all distances in between the near and far point correction. So it starts at distance and progresses until it reaches the reading portion. It gets more plussed as it approaches the bottom of the lens. First time wearers of any bifocal go through an adjustment period, but I find it's helpful for a first time progressive wearer to explain and even draw out a diagram of how the lens works primarily because the areas shown here inside the dashed lines are areas of distortion. They're not ground with the patient's prescription so that if the patient is used to wearing single vision lenses or lined bifocals or even no glasses at all, when they want to see something in their periphery, they're used to just averting their eyes. With progressive lenses, they'll need to turn their heads so that they're not looking out of the areas of distortion. Um, these can take one to five days to get used to, but after that, no problem. Progressive lenses always have very faint markings. If they're held up to bright light, these may be visible. First, there's some type of, of a mark, like this one's a circle. Sometimes it'll be a half circle or a circle with a dot in the, in the center or something. Each manufacturer has a different one, so this will tell you who made the lens. Then there is a number that will tell the strength of the lens. It's a two-digit number. This one says 2.5, which means that the strength of this lens is a plus 2.5. Let me rephrase that. The strength of the reading portion of the lens is, is what that number is. This one says it's a plus 250. If it were a plus 225, then that number would be 2.2. There'll only be two digits. Okay, before I discuss accommodative esotropia, let me describe a situation. Sometimes when you're testing a child, you test the, their acuities and they see 20-20 in the distance and 20-20 reading. And you think, well, they're not going to need glasses and they end up requiring a plus two lens, say. What gives? Well, remember the example I showed you of the myope, emetrope, and hyperope? This child can see the distance chart, but only when accommodating. And then they can also read close up because they're so young, they, they have such a ac great accommodative range that their eye can actually accommodate so much that they could also see close up. But the whole time that their eyes are open and they're looking at things, they're accommodating. Um, so when they're reading, they're really, really accommodating. A plus lens will allow them to will allow their eyes to relax sometimes when they're looking at the distance. Now, sometimes a, a situation like this will cause an accommodative esotropia. That's an esotropia brought on by the synkinetic reflex. Remember that accommodation, convergence, and meiosis. What you're seeing in this accommodative esotropia is the convergence. The eyes are converging because it's necessary for them to accommodate to see. So the correction for this is a plus lens that will alleviate the, the accommodation at distance and sometimes bifocals. Sometimes they're going to need it for distance and for reading. When prescribing both bifocals for children, the seg height needs to be much higher than that for adults. In fact, it should either bisect the pupil or be placed just under the bottom of the pupil, which is much higher than, than that of adults at the lower lash line. The reason is that the higher segment will ensure that the child actually uses the lower portion. I mean, with adults, it's just a matter of comfort. Adults can't see very well unless they, they do look through it. But for children, 
Um, well, we don't know. None of us really knows whether we're accommodating or not. We can't feel it in our eyes. Um, and since children can often see close up with or without that segment, and the point, the point of the corrective lens is to relax the, the accommodative effort, they, they sort of sometimes have to be forced to use it. So when it's put up that high, as soon as the child looks down or even glances down at all, they're looking through that near vision portion. Now I'll try explaining this to a parent. <laughs> um, if the child has accommodative esotropia, then it's evident the parent won't have any problem accepting that the child needs to wear glasses. But if the child, even if the child's complaining of headaches or asthenopia, it's acceptable. But if there are no external signs, it can be difficult to try to explain this to a parent why it's important for their child to wear glasses, even though they can see. Okay, this is the end of the first video on accommodation. There's so much here that I needed to stop so that you can digest it. And I'm going to go get to work on the rest of the accommodation and make a second video.